DCS World You'd be forgiven for thinking that DCS represents a niche of PC gaming reserved for the rich. For many, this innocuous piece of free software almost immediately blooms into a multi-thousand dollar endeavor. Everything is expensive. An often recommended HOTUS setup, Thrustmaster's Warthog, will set you back about $484 tax and shipped in California in April of 2020. Add in the CH Pro pedal set and Track IR with Track Clip Pro and you're looking at nearly 800 US dollars. That's a lot of money for some joysticks and sh**. But is this all necessary? Do you have to blow thousands of dollars to have an enjoyable experience in DCS World? I don't think it is. So, let's see if we can build an entire DCS World setup. I'm talking PC, HOTUS, head tracking, keyboard, mouse, and even the monitor for less than the cost of a new HOTUS Warthog. Let's get started. 15 miles. Box one, box one. Oh, Jesus. According to what you might see on the forums, you need to plop down about two grand on a top-end PC and about a grand in peripherals, not to mention a bleeding-edge virtual reality headset or track IR setup. And don't forget to spend about 500 bucks in modules. I'm a poster boy for this madness, with my current ridiculous setup costing, well, more than I'm willing to admit. And maybe that's why I wanted to take on this project. DCS World offers a combat flight simulation experience that is unrivaled in many respects. I wanted to start narrowing in on the lowest price of admission that still offers enough of the core DCS experience that make it so unique. This means I wasn't going to recommend just hooking up an Xbox controller to a PC and calling it a day. To get the most out of the sim, especially the full fidelity, studied level modules like the F-A-18 and the JF-17, you need proper head tracking and a solid HOTUS setup. So the rules are simple. Have everything needed for a turnkey DCS setup for less than 484 bucks. Also, everything I bought or made should be easily found on marketplaces like eBay or Amazon. Given enough time, you should be able to buy and build a comparable system if you live in a similar market. So what did I end up with? Let's start with the PC. I'm going for the tried and true cram a honking big graphics card in the old workstation route. For this, I like the Dell T3600. These 8 year old desktops were powerful in their day and used Sandy Bridge era Intel processors. Most come with a beefy 635 watt 80 plus gold braided power supply and can take up to 64 gigabytes of cheap and available ECC DDR3 memory. If you get a 635 watt version, chances are it'll also come with two 6 pin PCIe power connectors, making stuffing power hungry graphics cards in them a breeze. I picked mine up from eBay for $100 taxed and shipped. This was a great deal considering it came with 16 gigabytes of RAM and the processor I was already after, the Intel Xenon 1650. This 6 core, 12 threaded CPU is clocked at 3.2 GHz and turbos up at 3.8 GHz. In multi threaded applications, this CPU is surprisingly still relevant. However, its single core performance suffers dramatically next to modern CPUs. Most of the time, 16 GB of RAM is going to be enough for DCS. However, on crowded multiplayer servers or more complicated missions, you can quickly find yourself being bottlenecked by RAM. I suggest 32 GB of RAM for DCS, and thankfully, you can find 32 GB of ECC. DDR3 on eBay for just a little more than a dollar a gig. I paid $38 shipped for four 8 gigabyte sticks of DDR3. DCS also likes a lot of video memory, and although you can get by with a four gigabyte card like the GTX 1650 Super or the Radeon 5500 XT, both of which work really well for DCS, I suggest picking up one of the many, many used RX 480 8 gigabyte cards flooding eBay after the death of crypto mining. I love the RX 480. The 8GB of VRAM is still a ton, and these cards make light work of even brand new AAA titles at medium and high settings at 1080p. Even better, the use price is currently hovering just around 95 to 110 US dollars. With the global supply lines being what they are in April of 2020, storage is actually quite a bit more expensive than it was half a year ago. To save some money, I picked up a $17 used Samsung 120GB SSD for a boot drive, and I'm going to be running DCS on a 7200 500 gigabyte Barracuda, which I picked up for $11. All added up, that means the gaming PC part of the equation costs us a cool 266 US dollars. Despite most of it being almost a decade old, this is still a great system for tending to be gaming. For keyboard and mouse, I picked up the simple Alienware membrane keyboard and Logitech mouse for $13 tax and shipped. As for the monitor, nothing too fancy here, but I picked up this refurbished 21.5 inch Acer LED screen from Amazon Warehouse for $64 taxed and shipped. 
I'm actually really happy with this monitor, which has a 75 hertz refresh rate. Now the HOTUS turned out to be a bit tricky and probably where I overspent in this project. I initially tried to get by with the Logitech Extreme 3D Pro joystick, which I got for $33 shipped from Amazon. This is a solid joystick with good precision and feel, but the lack of input buttons really can kill the experience if you are forced to rely too much on keyboard commands. If you prefer flying simpler aircraft like the F5, F86, or World War II fighters, the Logitech might be a great choice for the money. Then, I picked up an old SciTech X45 throttle and stick combo from eBay for $45. I really, really wanted to like this stick. As the throttle is excellent, the layout and button distribution work fine for even complicated modules like the F18, F16, and Mirage 2000. However, the insanely bad tension spring callet design made this thing a staging mess. Even after I pulled it apart, cleaned and re-greased it, and modified the spring tension using zip ties. I'm not going to give up on this stick, but I think that'll be a topic for another video. I finally threw in the towel and went with the obvious choice. At anywhere between $140 and $160 new, Thrustmaster's T16000 stick and throttle combo represents excellent value. If you search eBay diligently enough, you can pick up the pair for just under $100 tax and ship like I did, which makes it an absolute bargain. For the T16000M joystick, Thrustmaster kept a fantastic magnetic hull sensor on its pricey Warthog stick and coupled it with cheaper to manufacture construction. Although the stick is kind of light on buttons, only having a single 8-way hat switch, the throttle is a reasonable facsimile of the F-18's throttle and therefore is absolutely festooned with hat switches, rotary and yaw controls, and even a pretty decent analog stick for target designator control. The action of the throttle can be a little stagey, however. All in all, coupled with the twist axis and the incredible precision that comes with the hull sensor for the primary X and Y axis, the T16000 is a very capable stick that will not detract from the overall DCA's experience at all. Head tracking shouldn't have been a challenge, but I made it one. Initially, I was convinced that I could get face track no IR working well enough to give it my recommendation and move on. If you aren't familiar, face track no IR is a pretty rad little piece of software that tracks your facial features through a webcam. When it works, it works really well, giving a near track IR experience for just the low, low price of a PSI webcam. However, I found it extremely sensitive ambient light and unreliable when faster head motions were made. I also found myself having to recenter the track as it would tend to drift over time. All in all, it was a pretty unsatisfactory experience and one I really can't recommend. I can absolutely recommend creating your own head tracking system using IR LEDs and a modified PSI webcam. Coupled with OpenTrack, a free and simple bit of software that replicates the functionality of track IR. It's honestly created one of the best head tracking experiences I've had this side of true virtual reality. Seriously, this setup proved way more reliable and less frustrating than even a track IR5 with a hat clip. I'm not going to go into the construction process or even the bill of parts here because it has been covered a bunch on YouTube, but all told, including a used Logitech gaming headset, the setup costs a cool $38. All added up, this means this entire setup costs 481 US dollars. That's a whole gas station hot dog cheaper than the Thrustmaster Hotus Warthog. For the whole damn setup. Sure we don't get rudder pedals, but between the throttle rocker and twist axis on the T16000, you have plenty of choices for yaw control. But cheap is worthless if the setup sucks to use. So how was the experience? Pretty damn good I'd have to say. I spent a lot of time experimenting with various video cards, RAM quantities, and visual settings to determine if this is a viable setup. I confirm what I'm sure a lot of you already know about DCS. DCS is mostly a single-threaded application. Unfortunately, with the 3.2GHz base clock of the Xenon 1650, this is almost always going to be your bottleneck with this build. DCS is also a RAM hog, and in the right circumstance I would see DCS eating up to 15-16GB to 16 gigabytes of system memory. VRAM as well. Even with the modest 1080p texture settings I set it at, I could see VRAM usage creeping past 4GB. And this is where we need to talk about expectations. If you're content to play on less populated servers and simpler missions without a huge global unit count, this system will produce great results. I saw mostly 50 to 80 frames per second and never dipped below 30 using the shown settings. Frame drops and stuttering were rare and I likely blame much of that on the fact that I insisted on installing DCS on a hard drive and not an SSD. But, if you insist on flying in very populated servers with a high number of AI units like Fraternity or Hoggett, understand you will probably have a pretty flawed experience. Fraternity, which is a very fun player versus environment server set on the Caucasus map, was a stuttering, jittery mess with frame rates sometimes dipping below 30 frames per second near airfields. Massive frame drops were also common, although I was able to fly an entire sortie including two intercepts and a successful landing. Still, this wasn't a great experience. This setup performed fine on a server ran by a group I fly with, 62AW. 
With almost 10 people on the server, dozens of ground targets and scripted AI interceptors, the experience was smooth and enjoyable. Performance issues likely come from too many global AI units and complicated mission scripting. In short, even with this modest setup, you can still have a fantastic multiplayer experience with lots of other players. Considering this setup performs great with even extremely graphically and CPU intensive games like Call of Duty Warzone, it demonstrates that DCS World is generally poorly optimized. If Eagle Dynamics follows through with their long-term goal of migrating DCS to the Vulcan API and enhances DCS's multi-threaded support, this setup should actually perform much better in the future than it does now, but that is purely speculative. Will the setup get you a constant 80 frames per second? Nope. Will it provide performance smooth enough to not distract and break focus and immersion from the core simulation? Absolutely. While the performance of the PC itself might not blow anyone away, the two clear winners in this exercise were the head tracking setup and the T16000. Dogfighting and cold starts, two regimes of the simulator that require a lot of head tracking, were fantastic experiences, and open track had absolutely no problem maintaining an accurate and smooth fix on my head position. The experience was so flawless I quickly didn't even think about it. The T16000 likewise melted into the background. The extreme precision of the joystick and ample inputs on the throttle meant that after an initial learning curve I had no issue flying even very complicated modules like DECA Ironworks' JF-17. A quick note on the JF-17, this module in particular paired really well with this setup. The controls were easily mapped to the available buttons on the T16000. Also, the cockpit seems a bit lighter weight in terms of a performance hit compared to Heat Blur's F-14 or Eagle Dynamics' F-A-18. Is it no wonder that this cheap and capable modern fighter works well with our cheap and sort of capable DCS setup? So, final verdict. Would I recommend someone go out and build this exact setup? No, yes, maybe. My main argument for no is because this is absolutely the definition of a dead socket. The upgrade potential for this PC is very limited and really not worth it. Building an AM4 based PC with a Ryzen 1600 AF would cost a few hundred dollars more with a similar graphics card but the potential to upgrade that system in the future is far, far greater. The head tracking and HOTUS solutions, however, are no-brainers if you're wanting to dip your toes in the DCS world. Even coming from the world of high-end PCs, high-resolution VR displays, and boutique-level HOTUS setups, I found the experience with the homebrewed IR head tracking and T16000 fantastic. And circling back to the PC, sure, it might not have much upgrade potential, but for 266 US dollars, can you do much better? This PC still absolutely chews through eSport and most AAA titles with ease. Also, with 12 available threads, I was able to run OBS in the background as well as a host of other utilities I use while flying DCS, like SRS, OpenTrack, and Discord. I can see a few use cases for this sort of build. If you have a daughter or son who has expressed interest in DCS World, this could be a great way of getting a wingman on the cheap. Also, maybe you don't want to spend more than $500 on a setup but have always loved military aviation. I've seen a lot of older members of the DCS community really lean into the study level sim aspect of the game, using it to experience aircraft that they admire their entire lives in a completely interactive way. The system would be great for someone who wanted to run through cold starts and meticulously follow checklists but has very little interest in joining a busy and chaotic multiplayer server. Building the system has been a fun experience and I found the whole project immensely rewarding. One critical thing I would do differently if I did this again would be to build a system with a more modern processor with perhaps fewer cores but better per core performance. This would likely help overall system performance when it comes to DCS world. In conclusion, you can build an entire DCS setup for less than the price of a HOTUS Warthog. And the results aren't bad. I'll likely be lending the system to a friend who wants to give DCS a try before they commit the funds for a proper setup of their own. If you are running DCS on older or somewhat obsolete hardware, I'd love to know about it in the comments. Thanks for joining me today, and don't forget to subscribe if you're interested in more DCS and hardware content in the future.